Hi and welcome to the second in this series of diary entries following our journey into going electric. In the last episode we discussed our thought process when deciding to make the commitment to change to an EV, uh, electric vehicle, uh, but of course the key factor in all of this is understanding the range of your car when charged and the charging options that are available to you. Uh, so first of all what most people want to see is what is the range of a specific EV. Now, if you look on a car manufacturer's website, you'll see quoted a WLTP range. Uh, it means Worldwide Light Test Vehicle Test Procedure, another one of these acronyms that we keep coming across. And the very first thing that you learn is that this range is completely meaningless and overstated. Uh, it's a bit like the Marpa Gallon statistics for an ICE car, internal combustion engine, um, and even an honest car dealer will tell you to ignore this and quote you a lower range. Now the best place to go to start is a website called www.ev-database.uk and this seems to be the bible on all the info you need to know about your chosen EV and it's a great place to compare models. So let's start by having a quick look and a bit of a demo on uh, the EV database website. Okay so this is the evdatabase.uk website and uh, this is the, the website I was mentioning that basically gives you all the information you need to know about your various different cars. Um, I won't go through them all, but you can see here, you can filter by make, by body style, by price range, uh, whether the car's currently available or whether it's something upcoming in the future. Um, and again, you've got loads of other options here where you can put in ranges. Uh, interestingly, tow bars is quite an interesting thing. Um, one probably thing we, we found is that cause we, we've got a tow bar bike rack and our particular EV can't have tow bars fitted. That sort of does seem to be a common thing with um, EV cars that most of them don't support tow bars at the moment. Uh, I think uh, there's very few cars, if you've got a caravan, there's very few cars that you can buy today that will allow you to tow a caravan. So that may be a consideration you want to take into an account. And then for each car, what we can do is look at this in detail and see how it breaks down. So uh, obviously you've got the price, um, your average lease price, um, and a few bits and pieces, uh, some statistics and things. Um, but I'm just going to compare these two cars. So here's the uh, the new VW ID3 Pro, and here's the new newer one, which is a Pure, which will be out in 2021. You can see there's a big price difference between the two cars, and they look virtually identical. Um, if we have a look at them in a bit more detail, you'll probably understand a little bit why. So um, here we've got the price and how many kilowatt hours the battery is. So again, how much storage it can have in there. And then what we've got is the range. And I did talk about range earlier, and this is a lot more complicated um, than uh, a normal car because not only does it impact on how you drive, um, whether you, you know, drive fast or slow, or the types of road that you're driving on, but it also is impacted by weather as well. So um, what you can see here is the range does drop quite dramatically in cold weather. Um, so these figures, I think, are probably better to look at than the WLTP range numbers um, that you saw earlier. So again, get a little bit of an idea on that. Uh, and again, there's loads of other uh, data and statistics on here. So it is a good place to come and compare all the different uh, vehicles. Here's the interesting one, um, you know, how long your charge time is. So seven hours 30. So an overnight charge, um, you know, will basically give you some sort of idea of how long it's going to take, take to change your car overnight and what's the maximum charge you can put into it uh, as well. Um, so, you know, you can go up to a 50 kilowatt charger and that's how long it takes to charge using a fast charger. So you can see the big difference between charging at home overnight and then using a fast charger at the motorway service station. So give you that sort of idea, um, well worth looking at exploring. And if we just compare that with the, uh, the current ID3 Pro, which is significantly more expensive, um, what you'll see is the, the main reason for that is the size of the battery. And that's really what you're paying for is the, the bigger the battery and the more storage you've got, the more expensive the car. Um, and you can see the difference here between the cold weather range. I think it was 120 on the normal car. This has got 200 in cold, uh, uh, cold weather. So you need to bear that in mind. Think about the usage of your car and work out which is the appropriate one uh, for you and whether you're prepared to pay that extra money. 
I know EVs are more expensive, but your fuel is a lot cheaper. What you're doing here is pre-buying your fuel in advance. And it's over, as you use it, well, you'll start to make the savings and get that money back. Uh, maybe a good reason for using a lease, because at least you're only paying for it monthly rather than pay, paying for the whole thing up front. So that's EV database. And I think that's well worth taking a look at as well. OK, so now we have an understanding about the range of the vehicle and we're able to choose a vehicle that best fits with our usage. The next thing is to sit down and work out how and where we're going to charge it. Now, from our point of view, we wouldn't have considered an EV if we couldn't charge from home. Um, if you take our village, for instance, there are lots of properties without off-road parking. Uh, there are some flats, there are some cottages. Um, so the whole concept of having to take your car to another location to charge really isn't an option for us. Um, and at least until we get some charging points in the village. And that's maybe something our parish council should look at. Um, we've got a village hall nearby, we've got solar panels on the roof. Maybe that's one of the things we could look at is having some public charge points there, uh, powered wherever possible by solar. Uh, I don't know, but I think these sorts of things will come over time. Now we expect 95% of our charging to be done from home. Um, it's only gonna be on long journeys for holidays or business travel that we'd not expect to get back home, home and back on a single charge. So the first thing is, how do you go about getting a charger? Now we've already done this with the help of our car dealer. And although our car's still a month away, um, we wanted to get all this set up and ready and up and running, uh, ready for when the car arrived. And it was actually surprisingly easy. The first thing we did, we looked at our energy supply and we arranged to have a smart meter installed. Now, we've avoided this for years, uh, but it is key to getting cheaper energy for charging. Um, we just arranged it with the energy provider. The guy came, it was raining, sat in a tent on the drive, out of the rain, tinkered with a load of stuff in the meter box, which I'll show you in a minute. Um, some of the extra gubbins you're gonna see in there was actually added by the EV charger electrician, so it's quite complex in there now. Um, but we now have the gadget that shows our usage. Um, here it is actually, I'll show you the, uh, the little gadget that we got. Um, so that gives us an idea of how much electricity, how much gas that we're using. Probably my only complaint is that this needs to be permanently plugged in. Um, it's got a battery and the idea of the battery is that you can take it to another room and switch devices on and off and see what the impact is. But apparently the battery deliberately doesn't hold the charge for long. So uh, our energy provider bulb say, basically this has got to be plugged in all the time. And uh, I think that's a bit of a shame really, but it's about the only negative thing I've got about the smart meter uh, conversion routine. Um, now the other thing that we were aware of, and, and again, it was friend Neil who mentioned uh, EV tariffs to me. He, he's got an EV tariff for his Tesla car. And um, we found that Bulb were beta testing an EV tariff. Now you can't see this on the website. You have to already be uh, a Bulb um, sort of customer. But once you are, you can switch to this beta testing tariff, which is a, a similar to an economy seven tariff where your overnight energy is cheaper. And then what you do is you charge your car using cheaper energy. Uh, and that's why you need the smart meter because the smart meter is the thing that tracks which half hour period the energy is being used. But here was a big surprise. Um, with this particular tariff, peak energy is only from 4 p.m. to 7 p.m. Off peak is 7 p.m. to 4 p.m. the following day. So that's 21 hours of off peak energy. Now, we're both home workers, so we're in the house using electricity all the way during the day. We do our washing during the daytime and our drying and all of this sort of stuff. So actually this tariff is perfect for us, regardless of having an EV. Um, we're already gonna make savings on our energy costs just by switching to this tariff, regardless of having the car. Um, again, with most energy providers, um, there are referral codes you can give people to sign up and you get cash, I get cash, works really well. I'll put the referral code in the comments uh, below if you fancy signing up to Bulb. Um, but uh, I'll leave that up to you. Now, probably the surprising thing was the switch of the tariff took longer than it get to get the smart meter installed. The smart meter was installed within oh, know, less than two weeks and it took about a month to get the tariff switched. Um, so it's again, one of those things, if you're waiting for an EV to be delivered, start the process on this early and then at least when your car arrives, your tariff will be sorted as well. Now, while we're talking about tariffs, 
And something I've also discovered recently is that Octopus Energy, they have a new tariff called Agile. And this is where the rates change by the hour and can even go negative. Bear that in mind. So basically what you do, they send you the rates every day for all the individual hour slots. And then you use your appliances, your car or your dryer, whatever it is you want to use, when the rates are really, really low. And the interesting thing is if the rates go negative in that hour slot, then they pay you. Yeah, they pay you. You actually get a refund for using their energy. And the reason for this is because there is excess energy in the grid at certain times. Now, when you're looking at renewables, if you get a windy day, so the turbines are generating loads of energy, or particularly sunny day when solar is creating loads of energy, then the grid has more energy than it needs, and they need to get rid of it. They can't store it, so they have to get rid of it. So what they'll do is they'll tell you when the energy needs to be got rid of, and therefore they'll pay you to take it off their hands for them. Bizarre concept, um, but it was interesting. I've seen a couple of videos on this, and people showing days where they've had a negative number on their bill for that particular day. Now, it, it seems hard work to keep a track of, and I think you could potentially become a slave to when you switch devices on and off. But if you really are into wanting to cut your bills, that may be something you could look at. As a result, I'm not convinced our new tariff um, is still the best for us. There's loads of other providers now have got EV alternatives. And until we've got a pattern of data to use, I'm going to stick with Bulb. But I might look at switching once I've got a pattern of energy that I can use and compare. So there you go. Okay, so now charging the car. So what are the options? Um, well, the first option is what's known as a granny charger, um, or as we know it, a three-pin plug. Uh, it's great to have one of these cables uh, for emergencies. Uh, it could be you're visiting somewhere where there aren't any proper chargers, uh, maybe going to see friends or something, and you can plead with them and say, can I plug my car in, please? Um, but they're very slow, as the energy output from a normal socket really isn't high enough for an EV. And, and they're not recommended as chargers, but they are good for emergencies. The most common option is to have a seven kilowatt charger fixed to your wall, either outside of your house or in your garage. Now this pumps out a lot more power than your domestic supply and means charging your car is faster than a granny charger. Um, again, most cars can charge from zero to full uh, easily overnight with a seven kilowatt charger. And again, this was incredibly easy to get sorted. Um, when we ordered our car, the dealer registered us with a company called Podpoint, and Podpoint will install your charger for you. Uh, obviously, there's a cost with this, but there's a government grant that covers some of the cost of the installation. In our case, the dealer also covered some of the cost, and that just left us with £150 to pay to get our 7 kilowatt charger installed at home. So absolute bargain. Now this does vary from dealer to dealer and we are aware that some are actually entirely free as they co cover the cost of everything over and above the government grant. So again, worth doing your research on that when you've chosen the car that you like. Uh, if you're buying a second hand EV or renting a car as we discussed in the last video, this is something you might have to sort out for yourself. Um, you'll still be eligible for the grant but you will probably need to pay the difference yourself in that case. But again, installation was really simple. Um, we completed the registration online. They asked us to send photographs of our meter box and the installation site and a few other bits and pieces. And then about a week or so later, it was installed. And that was it, simple as that. So I'll tell you what, let's pop outside. We'll have a look at the meter box, see what happened when the smart meter was installed. And we'll have a look at the charger so you can see what that looks like as well. Okay, so here we are outside the house and a couple of things just to show you. Uh, first of all, I'll show you what our meter box looks like now. Um, you'll probably find it looks a lot more complicated than yours currently does. Um, so here's the uh, original meter, as you can see there. Um, but there's been a few extra bits and pieces put in. Uh, a lot of it to do with the smart meter that's inside the house. But then there's also some extra bits and pieces that was added for the EV charging equipment. Um, so again, if we look in here, We've got a little circuit breaker in case the EV charger trips. So uh, again, if I get any power supply issues, there's a few extra breakers to do. Um, but these are all on the outside of the house rather than being on the inside, which is uh, good news. And then basically what we have is cable that goes from the box 
Now we could have had the charger fitted on the outside of the house if we wanted, uh, but what we chose to do here was have it fitted inside. So nice and neat, um, quite flush and flat to the wall, and then we've got the cable that winds round, and that gives us our charger. And this is what's known as a Type 2 charger. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about more, those a little bit more later, but basically unwind this, stick it in the back of the car, and then the charging timer on the car will wait for the cheap energy time to kick in and uh, just start loading as and when. So no more visits to petrol stations and having to pay for expensive fuel on our credit card. So all of this has been done while we've been waiting for the manufacturing delivery car, but the great news is that means we're ready to go. We're just waiting for the car to turn up now. A um, couple of other things on charging. It's worth adding that Podpoint, who installed our charger, also operate a UK network of public chargers as well, um, including most of these at Tesco sites where the chargers are free. So the idea being is you go to Tesco's to go and do your shopping, plug your car in while you're there, get a top up of your energy, and it doesn't cost you a penny. Um, our, char our Tesco's is right by Litchfield Town Centre. So we could actually, if we're going into Litchfield shopping, um, we could go and plug the car in, wander around Litchfield for an hour, come back, and again, we've got some free energy. Um, but because we're using their home charging network as well, it means we're already signed up for the Podpoint network, which is good news. Um, another interesting thing is, if you've had one of their chargers installed, you can actually add your home charger to their public network and make it publicly available for others. And therefore, it'll appear on the map, and people could come, come to your drive, plug the car in, charge their car on your drive, and then you charge them for the energy. Now, it's not something we're going to be doing, because as you've seen, we've put our charger in the garage for security purposes. But again, when you look for public chargers, you may come across these from time to time, and it, it is something that's quite normal. And that leads us on to the final discussion in this session, and that is how to find a public charger. Now, the one thing that really impressed me about Tesla was their inbuilt sat nav and how it integrated with their charger network. So when route planning, it would advise where to charge and for how long you need to charge to get to your destination. This isn't quite so easy with other vehicles. Um, there are so many different manufacturers with varying car data and also so many different charging networks. So it can be a little bit more confusing. However, there is an app that pulls this all together. It's a website or an app called ZapMap. And to be honest, this is a must have app for all non Tesla EV owners. Uh, everybody who buys an EV is gonna want this on their phone and on their car. Um, so what I'm going to do, for the purpose of a demo, I'm going to use the website version because it's easy for me to record. Um, but make sure you download this. Do this now, download it now, stick it on your phone and play with it. It's great fun and really interesting. Um, but let's switch over to my web browser and we'll have a look at uh, ZapMap. Okay, so here we are. This is uh, ZapMap. And uh, see that there? That's the website, zap-map.com. Um, and a couple of things, when you first sign up for this, there's no charge to sign up. Uh, you need to register with uh, your user ID and password, and also you can enter the details about your EV, so it understands about your mileage and your range. And I'll do a quick walkthrough of this. So first thing is, um, I'm looking at my local area. So we're, we're based here in Whittington, and as you can see at the moment, we don't have any charges in here. But there's a fair few options uh, over here in town. Uh, in Litchfield. So let, let's just have a look at what some of the options are that we've got available for us. So uh, the first one, this is something called Swinton Hall. So this is a hotel nearby. We can see that's on the Zero Net network, so we can see who the provider is. And if you remember seeing my, my charger earlier, um, you can see this uh, particular one is a, a Type 2 7 kilowatt charger. So this isn't particularly high powered, it's about the same as home. And I suppose the ideal thing is for, for guests of the hotel. Um, so when uh, they, they check into the hotel, they can plug the car in and then they can get home safely. So again, something if you're traveling um, for holidays and stuff, you may want to look for hotels that have got chargers available. Um, if you have a look at this one, with a little similar house on. Uh, again, we can see that um, it's a type two charger, um, but this is a, a private charger that someone set up um, and basically you can uh, visit there and charge at their home if you want to. Whether anybody has or not, I don't know, but you can see that's a, a sort of private charger. 
Uh, another option here, this is um, Tesco. So this is our Tesco there, and we can see there's four of the Type 2 chargers available. Uh, again, they're not highly powered, but they're good for a top up while you're doing your shopping in town. Uh, again, um, something ideal. And again, these are the free ones. These are the pod point ones I mentioned earlier that are free and you'll find these at most Tesco's. Um, the different colours often indicate more power. Um, so there's a few different uh, power options. And really what you're looking for is the higher power chargers. And just want to point out here. So this is uh, BP Pulse. Now, I think this is the same as something called the Polar Network. Now, when we bought our car, we've been told that we get six months free charging on the Polar Network. And I believe that BP Pulse and Polar are one and the same thing. Uh, again, we can see there is the Type 2 charger that we've got. But here we've got another charger with a couple of extra sockets on the bottom. And when we get the car, I'll show you this because that second piece is covered up with a little plastic clip. And basically, you can uncover it, and that means you can plug these other chargers in called CCS chargers. Now, if you look at these and look at the kilowatt hours, these are much higher powered, you know, 43 and 50 kilowatt ones. So these are the sorts of chargers you might find that you have um, at service stations, for instance, where you can go in and in 30 minutes to 40 minutes, you can probably get 80 percent charge in your car. Um, it is worth mentioning that with charging that often um, the first 80 minutes will the first 80 percent will charge very, very quickly. But then what happens is the charging slows down so that it doesn't damage the battery between 80 and 100 percent. So what you'll find is on fast chargers, you'll probably just go up to 80 percent, unplug and then carry on with your journey. Um, so that's something that's worth mentioning. OK, what about um, route planning? So let's tell you what, let's go from Litchfield. Uh, oops, that uh, might help if we start here. I'll tell you what, let's go from Litchfield Cathedral um, to probably one of the hardest places to get to um, in England, and that's going to Land's End in Cornwall. And here, obviously, we can got loads of extra options here, like adding stops, doing it in reverse. Um, we've got the options to change our EV model, change what we think our range is and those sorts of things. And then we can basically ask it to find us a route to Land's End. So uh, it's a bit like Google Maps. Uh, it probably is using Google Maps, looking at uh, the colours and things. And that's found us a couple of routes and we can pick and choose which one we fancy. So tell you what, let's go for this route and see what it comes up with. And there are the charges on the route. And I think that's the first thing is nobody can tell me now that there isn't going to be a problem trying to find a charger on the route. I don't think experience might tell me differently. But there are all the chargers on that route that we could use. And the purple ones, uh, as you saw earlier, these are the uh, the higher powered ones um, that we can use. Now, the other thing that we can do with this is so we don't see all of them and get confused by too many options is if we choose suggest chargers. Uh, and update the route, what it will then do is work out where we need to charge to get to our destination. And there you can see, basically, if we were to drive down the M5, get down to Somerset, basically, at some point there, we're going to need to top the car up. Um, and basically, here we can see how many charges there are. We can look at the details of them. We can see, again, these are on the BP Pulse network that we saw a little while ago. And we can see there's 50 kilowatt chargers or 43 kilowatts. So these are pretty fast chargers. A uh, couple of things to mention. Um, we talked about ICE cars before, internal combustion engines. Um, this thing here, report iced. Um, this is where uh, basically uh, an ICE car, uh, a normal petrol or diesel car, has basically parked in a charging bay and blocked the chargers. Uh, and you re can report that. Um, the other things that you can do with this is, you know, give it feedback, say that it was a good charge. You can update the status of it if it's down. Um, lots of different things that you can do on there. But you can see, basically, this is at Miller and Carter, uh, at Western Gateway. And that means if I pull up there, plug my car in for 30 minutes, 40 minutes max, I'll have enough charge to get me all the way down to Land's End. And as most of you will know, you're never going to drive from Litchfield to Land's End without uh, a drink or a food break. 
there's tons of other options on here. I mean, it's a great, great website. Um, you know, the percentage, how much charge you want at the starting journey. So you can put your parameters in there for how nervous you are about charging. Uh, distance from the main route, so how far you're prepared to divert off your main route to go and get a charge, uh, various different things. I have to admit, I think when I do this for the first time, I'm probably going to go for the first charger that's available um, with a view that if there's a problem or the bay is full and I've got to wait, maybe I could come down to this one. Worst case scenario, down to that one. Um, but, you know, I, I want to de-risk it as much as possible. Again, once we get the car, we'll we'll have a proper go at this and we'll find out how it really works in the real world. Okay, so probably the last thing we need to do is to download apps for the most common charging providers and sign up ready so we don't have any hassle when we reach a charge point. We've watched, watched a load of YouTube videos on ch public charging and this always seems to be the biggest issue that you turn up a charger, it's on a different network to what you normally use and you haven't got the correct app for it and you've not been registered. Now, this is changing as the government are going to enforce all providers to have contact paying list options going forward, um, and that should be better. But sure enough, you will probably want to have loads of apps pre-installed just in case. And again, that's sort of what we've done here. Um, basically, we've uh, gone through, found some of the most common providers, downloaded their apps, uh, registered for them uh, with card details. So in theory, when we turn up, at uh, a charger shouldn't be a problem we should be able to just use the app login and go um, that's the idea now of course all of this is still theoretic because we haven't got our car um, I'm talking as though I know what I'm doing here and actually I know nothing because we haven't even got the car yet to charge but I don't think it hurts to do your homework um, and as a result I think it's probably the time to wrap up this particular video um, I think we've done our research I think we're fully prepared only time is going to tell um, I probably won't record another uh, another diary entry until we've got the car. Uh, if anything happens or there's any major news to sort of tell you, I'll probably do an, a quick short one. But the next one, hopefully, will be when we get the delivery of the car uh, itself, probably beginning of January. And then what we can then do is start to report back on the reality rather than the theory. So thanks again for watching. Uh, I'll see you then. Um, if you find this interesting, click like, click subscribe, share it with your friends. Again, I'm not really trying to get hundreds of thousands of hits with this. It's just something I'm finding interesting to do and, and hope you find it informative as well. Um, so, as I say, thanks for watching. Keep you posted when the next one's viewed.